Sunnis and Shias have a very rough time trying to refute us. Because, well, for two problems, really. The first problem is they never take the time to listen to what we're trying to tell them. And they never take the time for them to comprehend where we were coming from. And in the second thing, because of the first problem, they come up with this assumption that misrepresents us. And then they go and refute that assumption that they have in their mind. Okay, so that's called a straw man fallacy. Because you didn't know who we are, you come up with this idea and then you could try to defend, defeat that idea and then you think you won. But if you really try to take a look at what we're trying to explain to you, you cannot refute our position because you're arguing with the verses of God at this point. Yes, there are people that have barely read the Quran and then they try to go debate you and they say some very incredibly wrong things. But the people who are very good at understand or who, who have been working with the quran for a very long time and understand the position very well you guys struggle very a lot with us and we know this but with that said a, a good brother of mine I, I consider him a very good friend in my eyes and i don't know how he views me but i really do appreciate him he he did make a video that i want to respond to so uh with that said uh fire intro So the brother, so the brother is Farid responds. Uh, he is a very genuine, uh, sincere, good-hearted person. He talks to people with kindness. He takes the time and tries to listen. He is stuck with what he was told as a uh, growing up as what Islam is, and he kind of understands some of the stuff that he's saying. He is seeing certain perspectives that we're saying, but he's still failing to understand certain points. So he came up with a few arguments here, which they're they're very easy. To, to 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 talk about but um with that said yeah so let's uh, let's hear the good brother what he has to say and then i have a few words for him assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh um folks i just wanted to share some thoughts on the topic of the necessity of hadith um some may ask the question why aren't all the rulings in the quran instead you have a lot of rulings in the hadith and hey, um, why do I need to follow all these extra rulings because they're not in the book of Allah? If they were as important, then they would have been the book of Allah. So just to answer this very quickly, uh, or to explain our position very quickly, there's a lot of rulings in hadith. Those are structural, society, family rulings of their time. Okay, So these are not things that are all fully applicable now. So let's Consider that the pro that a, a prophet is walking today, right, or a messenger is walking today, and he goes, uh, "Only fans is illegal. It's haram. It's forbidden." Okay, so that's essentially now set for their time. That's our time now because that concept is living now. So when God's saying, or astaghfirullah, when there's hadith saying that you have to eat with your right hand and don't eat with your left hand because you have to wash and all this, this is not applicable now. We have running water now. We eat with spoons and forks now. So you, you're not going to deny the technology and the blessings that God gave you for you to eat with your hand when it's a lot cleaner to eat with utensils. It's a very simple concept. But you guys are saying that that's part of the religion. That needs to be done. Well, it's a very simple question, Farid. If the Prophet was alive this day and age, alayhi salawatu wasalam, would he do exactly and act the exact same way that he did back then? Absolutely not. Because the society's mind is different. The technology is different. And society has, has evolved to whatever it is today. So the sunnah would change. That's the thing that we're telling you. But you guys are trying to lock it back down to 1400 years ago because that's what they did. Yet, even during their time, the sunnah was evolving. What you were considering as tradition and, and, and sunnah. Uh, Abu Bakr came up with rulings that were fitting for the community that are now running. Uh, Umar bin Khattab came up with the taraweeh. These are things that are running. And some people feel bad for not making taraweeh when it's not part of the religion. So this is where we're trying to tell you. The Quran is completely sufficient in trying to teach, to, not trying, in telling you what is the religion that has been bestowed upon us from God on how to be a human being, how to treat each other, and what to do and what not to do. There's nothing else that is required outside of the Quran for you to fulfill your mission as a human being. That is the religion of God. What you're coming up with and what you're debating us with is structure. So you're always debating us upon the structure that you have been given and you are forced to say that this is religion. It isn't religion. It is what you believe is your interpretation of how to set up a structure of that religion. A very good example is the prayer. You guys have your way of praying, which not all of you are like concise with it, but that there is absolutely nothing wrong if someone instead of 
uh, you guys like you do your bowing down, which you call ruku, which I don't think is ruku, and then you say Sami Allahu liman hamida, and then you say uh, you, you say a, a, a quick prayer Sami Allahu liman hamida, Rabbana lakal hamda wa shukr, and then you 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 like prostrate, right? But it is not a problem if someone says Fatiha and then he does the same maneuver you do, and then he stands up and he says a short prayer of uh, a short uh, surah or a surah from the Quran. That is a new structure, correct? But that is not breaking the Quran. That is not breaking what you need to do. This is still applicable. This is our point to you. But this is where you don't get it. You guys are associating the structure of what you have, you made up, pretty much, because it's not all from the Prophet anymore. And you're saying that it's that. Now, when the Prophet is giving instructions to his people during his time, that is for him and his people. So go around the mountain and attack them from the behind because they're coming at us. So flank them. That is something a messenger could have said to his people, the Prophet said to his people during the war. And if they didn't do it, they would have lost because they had to obey him. But that doesn't make it a law for everybody else. Whatever is for everybody else is in the Quran. And every nation is going to have its own set of laws and understandings and interpretations. And they are going to approach the Quran a little differently. And that's the beauty of the Quran, that it fits everybody. It's universal. But you guys want to make it as an Arabic religion. If the Prophet was alive right now in this day and age, he would have a whole completely different sunnah. He would not eat with his hand, he would eat with the utensils. He has running water, he has all sorts of things that help him. So his sunnah would have changed. That's the point that I'm trying to tell you. The way he would have approached the internet would be different than you. There would be rules about the internet. There would be like, well, these social uh, things on the social internet you shouldn't be doing. But that's his sunnah. He would have been carrying a phone like us. Allahu alam. But these are the concepts you guys don't get. He wouldn't have used maybe uh, the miswak because there's better technology. There's a toothbrush. So you're not going to say that it's part of the religion and it's nice for you after you do your wudu to use the miswak. And that is part of the religion. It's part of sunnah. That makes no sense now. In this day and age, it's no longer applicable. So you guys are trying to lock the religion to 1400 century. 1400 years ago, I mean. So let's carry on. Well, you got to keep a few things in mind. Uh, firstly, the main the main purpose of the Quran is to provide you uh, a general guidance in terms of your connection to Allah, why you're here, where you're going. Um, what you do not have, of course, is a detailed list of every single action. The Quran, of course, is written in a very poetic, eloquent way. And if you had a list of do's and don'ts, that would simply take away from the poetic nature of the Qur'an. And due to that, um, you simply have the Qur'an speaking in general. Okay, so I'm going to stop you there for a little bit. Uh, brother, you, you, one, I'm going to forego the fact that you're comparing again to a poetic way. The Qur'an is not poem. I know what you mean. You're talking about the, the way it's presenting itself. It, it's very uh it's very articulate and it's very beautiful in the way it's presenting itself which is what you're comparing to poetry i'm going to forgive that but brother what are you talking about what you just presented is a no argument there is no argument of what you said you're saying god is not capable of giving you a list of things to do and not to do in the quran and make it sound quranic <laughs> like come on, bro. he did that in chapter 17 don't don't kill your kids out of fear of you not having enough money do not kill a soul that i have not permitted you to kill uh, do not uh, do not approach fornication. Do not walk in the land arrogantly. Do not stand in what you don't know. Do not pursue what you have no knowledge in, which is mostly what your hadith is. So this is what I'm trying to explain, brother. God clearly gave you instructions of what not to do and to do in a Quranic style. So what you gave is a no argument, saying that God cannot give you a list of what to do and what you, he did. But you're saying that he didn't do it so it doesn't stay poetic so he put it in a different book so it can be what instructive at this point and it doesn't have to be in what you said poetic and remember farid you should watch out for that word poem and poetic i understand what you're saying but it's not a good way of approaching it about some orders and some prohibitions and then you have the prophet peace be upon him expounding upon those and going into detail about those specific matters and this this expansion, based on what the society required, was carrying on until the uh, what you guys call the Mu'tazila sect. Until they disappeared, then you locked down the religion to a certain way where nobody was now, certain people were uh, not allowed to be criticized. Like Ibn Ishaq, Bukhari, and all these other people that wrote their material, they were no longer allowed to be criticized and the religion got locked to that time period. And whatever is in their books, that's it. That is the clear cut. 
And you guys see it today. Sorry, I want to fix the picture. I don't want him to look like that. Um, that's the. Yeah. So, um, the. Um, so you're saying that, and and you can see it nowadays. They go run to the hadith as if this is where we get our religion from, and barely do they quote the Quran, because they're studying all these other books that have been written, and this echo chamber that got created, and saying this is religion. This is your structure. This is your structure. That's not religion. That's not nothing to do with religion. And most of what you're saying does not consign. So I'll give you something very simple. You're saying music is haram. That could be something that was done on a community where you, they don't want to play with music, so don't do music. But when God says that drink, like eating pork is forbidden, it's because it, it affected uh, the human from the get-go. If there was pigs around Adam and Adam ate pigs, it would have affected him negatively, just like how it would affect humans negatively now. If drinking, it, which is not uh, permissible, if you're drinking back then when Adam was around, he got drunk and he did things and he said things he was not supposed to say because he's drunk. It affects humanity the exact same way now. Music was permissible at the time of David in your own narrations and as per David, he composed music. So you're saying he was doing a sin on purpose, right? Where God was allowing him to sin on purpose, but now it's forbidden. This is where it doesn't make sense. This is where you have a disconnect. Whatever is harmful for humans will always be harmful for humans, and it's always haram. And these are the things that you guys added to the religion, where it's not religion. God did not discuss what music uh, music is. It's haram for certain things for you to indulge in, which is like uh, things that came from the devil, music for the devil, singing about things or shit that you shouldn't do. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with you glorifying your God with music. But you're saying that's completely haram. This is where you guys are disconnecting from what God has given you and what your people has been said, uh, be, be, your people have been telling you. First thought I wanted to share. Sorry, another example, which is a ruling. This one's a lot easier. You're saying the stoning. Okay, if someone commits adultery, stone them. Okay, but that is again a law of society at that moment. Though whoever's in charge, the way they want to deal with, with, uh, with, with. Adultery is stoning, but God hasn't told you to stone anybody. You can't say that this is a religious law. This is now the law of the land. This is how they want to approach it. But God said to whip them. And you can't give me, well, if it's married or unmarried. The exact same page when God is saying whip them, he's also talking about married couples. If 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 there was no one present, right? If there was no one present and her husband or her husband testifies, his testify his testimony is like four testimonies. So they're married. So it's nothing about stoning, it's literally still about the whipping. But then you guys want to interpret and add things to give victory to whoever, what uh, what uh, uh, Abu Ali said down the street. Abu Ali with the shahata. <laughs> the second thought is um, this idea of, hey, uh, there are a hadith that I just don't like, so... I don't want to follow any hadith. Um, you see, that's a strange way of approaching uh, hadith and honestly approaching history. There are many um, matters in history that we find questionable. And it's not a reason to reject history as a whole. Um, like imagine someone said, uh, I don't believe that Brutus killed Caesar. I believe this is a fabrication. Therefore, I can't trust history. Like, no, no one says that. Um, the natural thing to do is to say, yeah, that specific thing I don't trust. Um, but for you to reject history as a whole, uh, that's a strange jump. And unfortunately, we find that with Hadith. Uh, you have perhaps a narration or two that you find problematic. And instead of saying, yeah, those specific narrations, I have trouble swallowing. And you go from there to rejecting um, thousands of narrations. Uh, that, that, that doesn't really follow. That doesn't really make too much sense. Okay, but this is again where he's straw manning. Uh, one, I like the fact that you compared hadith to history. Okay, I don't need to study history for me to be a human being. And yes, your narrations and your hadith is more aligned to what history is rather than religious guidance. So for me, I don't go and go into your little details and niches unless if someone is a little learned and he wants to go into those niches. I stick with what you guys call Sahih. OK, 
okay? Bukhari Muslim. This is why we're always talking about these books, because you can't say, well, that's weak and that's strong, and you go into your science, which isn't a science, because you guys say the science of hadith, but the opposite of the scientific method is data gained by the testimonials. This is what the University of Texas said. Any data gained by testimonials is opposite of the scientific method. So you guys don't have a science. You have a method of trying to catch the liar. Bukhari memorized 600,000 hadiths, but he only gave you 7,000 as, as sahih. Well, the rest is what? Just went down in, with him in the grave. But this is where now we have a disconnect. We're not finding one or two narrations. We're finding multiple narrations, many narrations where they're negating the Quran. God is telling you to walk between Safa and Marwa. You guys say, no, 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 there's a certain portion you run. Well, why? Oh, because the uh, the mother of Ishmael, she ran during that time before she found Zamzam water. Okay, so why aren't the women running? Oh, well, because it's not nice for the women to run. It's not a place for women to run. Okay, so it's a tradition for women that the men are doing. God is telling you to walk in between the two mountains, but yet you have a portion to run. So that's that's alone. Uh, that's that's confusing. So this is where you're saying now this is a law and this is a religion and this is you have to do. No, you don't have to do it. God is telling you to walk. But now you're saying that, oh, well, uh, we're rejecting all of hadith. No, if whoever wants to go into your history and why certain things were said, fine. But do they have to? Absolutely not. Is that scholarship of religion? Absolutely not. Because the religion is, is in the Qur'an. That's where you're supposed to filter everything that's coming through to you from through the Qur'an. Yeah, this seems like something God would accept. This seems something that God doesn't accept. But it seems like Ibn Ishaq, Bukhari, a Muslim, if they were alive today... In the way you guys vent, like give credence to their book, you would not be allowed to say no to them. Anything Bukhari would have said to you is khalas, is, is golden, is sahih. Because he knows, in his brain, he knows what is sahih and isn't. And he was able to compile this book where you cannot criticize one, one hadith, even one hadith. It's all sahih, it's all sahih. When God says that he shows his signs to the believers, apparently a man before, when he was a jahil, he saw monkeys stoning each other. Uh, because she committed illegal monkey sex, adultery, as if there's adultery in animal world. Like, this is where you, I don't get it. This is where you guys are being very, like, mean. You know, God tells you in the Quran that it's the devil that stripped the clothes of Adam and Eve in the garden to show him their private part. But then you have a hadith saying that God stripped the clothes of Moses and made him run naked through his people, showed his private part to the children of Israel so that they don't say, oh, well, his penis was diseased you're talking about my prophet now and you're saying that god did what the devil uh would do and not even that not even that it, it gets worse god says that his throne is upon water you go oh there's a hadith that the devil's throne is on water you guys are committing shirk that's the problem this is why we don't need your nonsense at this point and what's strange is um as opposed to history hadith due to the care um, of the classical Muslim scholars, they were so rigorous in terms of authenticating the reports. There was no rigorous. There is no rigorous. Because the way you're authenticating a report, and we can go to, very, to Tabari very quickly. The oldest book of Tafsir you have is Tabari. Okay? And he wrote your hadith with Isnad on how uh, he came up with the, the exegesis of certain verses. And then you go to a verse where it's very important, the one about Salah. Okay? But then he has a word, so perform the prayer on two ends of the day and a portions of the night, right? And then he, there's a word that's often repeated in his uh, in his exegesis, which is The people of interpretation differed. Okay, so they and then each and then he lists the different interpretation. Oh, uh, the two ends of the day is uh uh, is uh, noon and afternoon, and then the two the, the portions of the night is Fajr, Isha, and Maghrib. Uh, no, no, no. There's an interpretation where it's the Fajr and the Maghrib, and then parts of the night which is Isha, and then they, uh, like they, they have different interpretations, and they all Subhanallah link back to the Prophet, the magical chain of his net. So what they're saying is the Prophet went to a group of people saying, this is the interpretation of this verse. And then he went to a whole set of different people. This is the interpretation of the verse, which is different to this one. And then he goes to a whole different set of people and he goes, this is the interpretation of the verse and it's contradictory to the first one. And then we need Tabari to tell us which one is the right one. So the Prophet essentially in their idea is someone who's lost. 
someone who has to reinterpret the Quran so many times to so many different people and they all have a snad back to him or oh, this Sahabi told me and he told him and he the Prophet told him so it's it's always this snad but it's confusing and this is not one verse in Tabari this is most of Tabari's uh, people of interpretation differed the people of interpretation differed the people of recitation differed the people of recitation differed so he even goes into the details like the way they're saying the words and they all link it back to the prophet <laughs> and so so this is where he what he's saying yeah they have a rigorous way of killing anyone who comes up with an objection which what they did for many years for thousands of years anyone who came with a clear objection they killed him they put him in jail or killed him so his work was not popularized and everyone else just became an echo chamber. So the, the, the Sunni approach is to reproduce the material every 20, 30 years. They just reproduce it. That's what Albani did. That's what the people before him did. They just echo chamber. Because if you went off course, you're dead. Nowadays, it's difficult because there's internet. As opposed to any form of classical history, Roman, Greek, Persian, you won't find anything similar. To hadith in terms of rigorousness so i i mean personally uh what what would make sense to me is to accept a hadith and reject all of history that would make a lot more sense than to accept all of history and reject all of hadith that, that just doesn't make any sense to me i can reject both the hadith and history not delve into it and i still can be able to understand what the quran is telling me and i'm still able to serve my god as being a the human being that God has told me to do into how Abraham used to think. Millet Ibrahim. I don't need your history, nor do I need your narrations, which I love that you're comparing hadith to history because that's all it is. It's not religion. Religion is not history. Religion is not tradition. Religion is not language. Religion is not culture. Your religion dictates all of that, but they don't take precedence on to dictate what religion is. That's the whole point. Um, and thirdly and finally, the Quran to be truly appreciated, you need to be familiar with the historical context. That's a necessity. Um, if you're not familiar with what's going on at the time, if you're not familiar with their classical language, if you're not familiar with their their customs, a chunk of the Quran wouldn't make sense to you because you're a 21st century individual living in a completely different world. Um, one example is uh, chapter 2 verse 189 before we get into the verse there's a verse literally in the quran that says oh do they not ponder and understand what the quran uh, like do they not understand what the quran is do they have a seal on their hearts right do they have something in their ears so he's saying you can't understand the quran while god's saying like those that don't understand the quran have a veal on their hearts we're able to understand it we don't have whatever he just listed here i don't have that problem i'm seeing the quran applicable in all its verses in my day and age today there's either a lesson to learn or to literally apply it. And then he makes a big mistake here with the verse that he quoted. That says... So this is chapter 2, 188, right? Or 189. Okay, so in English, I'm just going to give you a quick translation. They ask you about the, uh, the like, the, the, the crescents, right? Uh, say that it is a timing for the people and for the pilgrimage, the hajj. Uh, and it's not righteousness to come to the houses from their back, but the righteousness is to be uh, aware, like conscious of God, okay? Uh, and approach houses from its doors, from their doors, and be conscious of God in, so that you would, uh, like, succeed, right? So he, this is literally what the verse is saying. Don't come from the houses from, from its back doors come from the front doors even in america they have back doors so if you're going to someone's house no approach the front door that's that's how you become righteous i don't like it if i had a back door and my neighbors all constantly coming from the back door no 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 show up but normally duck on the door and come with politely coming from the back door is problematic it's rude and it's also uh suspicious if people are showing up to my back door that's literally what the verse is saying like <laughs> approach things from head on don't approach things from the back. That's an example of what is being told to you. Don't enter houses from the back and enter them from their doors. Like, what's going on here? The verse is very clear. It's a universal thing. It's very good for you and it's righteous for you to approach doors or houses from their front door. 
Don't come from a side or back door. Where are you confused? For you? Why, wh okay, so what's your narration going to tell me? And watch how his narration even, like the, the verse disproves his narration. I'm not saying that it's not true, but the verse is more universal than just his interpretation. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put that picture like that. Well, um, back in the day, when people were going out to pilgrimage, what used to happen was um, they felt that uh, they had the superstition that uh, you shouldn't enter your home from the front door if you forgot any if you forgot something. So what they do is they'd go from the back of their houses and they would like break they, they would like actually break through their houses, dig into their houses in order to to get whatever um, they forgot inside. Some just random weird superstition and of course um, the quran uh says that this is not something good and stop doing it um, so he's saying uh the, um, sorry wait so this is good so what he's saying is that uh he uh, the reason why this verse came down is because they used to go outside of their house right for hajj i believe is what he said and then they would leave their houses and they would come back to their own houses and break it but here it would say <laughs> here houses is all houses <laughs> sorry i'm not very good with the diacritics then it would have been about the people's own houses so whatever he said maybe it's accurate of what happened i don't know i don't have that knowledge it's an assumption it's just theory at this point i did not witness it i can't say that it's the truth from god of what he just explained but what he is telling me now, it does not uh, fully fit the verse. Because it says, وَلَيْسَ الْبِرُ أَنْ تَأْتُوا الْبُيُوتَ It's not بُيُوتَكُمْ Your houses, their houses. No, that's where you see what you're telling me. Yeah, it's a nice interpretation maybe for their time. But for my time, is just literally telling me, do not approach houses from the back door. That's righteousness. And I don't approach houses from the back doors because that's what God ordered me to it's again if you if you simply look at the quran if you read the verses you have no idea what it's talking about and, and what you had was um second generation muslims you even have a companion of the prophet peace be upon him speaking about what exactly happened what exactly uh is behind those verses and then of course several others especially when it comes to matters to do with the pilgrimage um several verses that have to do with the pilgrimage just by reading them You'd have no idea what's going on unless you're familiar with the historical context. No, that's not true. Me and... Sorry, I just want to fix the picture again. Um, yeah, so me and uh, three other believers, like, from the same methodology, which we just understood each other. We, we just, like, we studied the Qur'an together. We went to the pilgrimage together. We had absolutely no problem going by exactly what, what the Qur'an was saying. And we, like, hey, here's Safa and Marwa. Those are not historical context. Those are landmarks. It's very simple. Those are not going to be crazy and gone. Here's the Beit al-Haram. That's very clear. Here's Arafat. Here's very clear. Okay, here's the procedure of what you need to do. But here's where, again, you guys always have a reason to break the verses of God. So in the Quran, it tells you that during the Hajj, you have to sacrifice, right? You have to sacrifice uh, an offering. Uh, uh, hadi, right? But uh, for those that do not have a, an offer of sacrifice, to fast three days in Hajj. Okay. Now here's the problem for them: how they break the verses of God. God is saying to fast three days if you don't bring a sacrifice. Okay. But problem is the day they do their sacrifice is the day of uh, Eid, Eid al-Adha. So the day they're supposed to give their sacrifice, because of their own rules. It's haram for them. It's not. It's forbidden to them for them to not uh, to, to fast during Eid. So they're not allowed to fast. They, they're not allowed to fulfill the verse. So they now have to have a dilemma. I didn't bring a sacrifice. I'm not going to give a f fasting because it's not fasting. I'm going to celebrate Eid. So that's where you guys are problematic. The God, the God is literally telling you, if you don't bring a sacrifice, fast those three days. You're saying, no, it's Eid. It's haram for us to fast. It's forbidden to fast during Eid. So we're not going to fast it. Okay, then your narration is wrong. And there's only one Eid, there's technically one Eid that the Prophet would have enjoyed because he had one pilgrimage. But you have all these narrations about the Eid al-Adha, but I believe from what I understand, what you told me, and I'm not sure, that he had one pilgrimage. How many pilgrimages did he have? How many Ramadans did he have? But apparently Gabriel used to come to him every Ramadan and review the Qur'an with him. 
Well, the Quran wasn't complete until when? So what was he reviewing? See, where this is where the, you guys say things. You have no idea what you're saying. If he's going to completely review the Quran, it would have been at the end. <laughs> Not every Ramadan. So uh, there isn't a verse in the Quran where they need to do something, where there isn't a narration negating it or breaking it some way. This is what I think Iblis did to them. He wrote to them all these narrations, forced it upon them. So there isn't a verse in the, in, in the Quran where they don't have a small exception or a rule breaking it or saying something otherwise. You can't make the dead here. Oh, except Prophet Muhammad made the dead here. So God didn't say the truth. Uh, okay, so you did you see somebody who he forbids the prayer? Oh, yeah, well, Prophet Muhammad said that the prayer is forbidden between these two times. Why? Oh, because when the sun comes out, it has horns of the devil. Okay, so why is it that you're putting on top of your mosques this minara, which you're putting a hilal, which looks like the horns of the devil? Oh, well, that's not for you to know. Okay, so I'm not going to listen to you because God told me not to listen to you and I'll worship him and pray whenever I want. You see what I'm saying, Farid? You guys don't know what you're saying. You're negating the book of God and mostly all your narrations. God said when they have like a wise head and they reach the age of maturity, not the age of puberty, the age of maturity when she's menstruating, that's when she's legal to get married. No, 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 you can marry her at six. Well, it's not his wife because he didn't consummate the marriage until nine. No, she's his wife if she married him at six and that's an illegal marriage as per the Quran. But then you guys play your apologetics and you come at us and you say we're crazy, that we need your nonsense. Come on, Habibi. We don't need your history. Now, for more uh, information on the topic of the necessity of hadith, I would recommend a book by yours truly called The Necessity of Hadith, uh, which you can pick up at Dar al-Aqam. By the way, folks, I'm not making any money out of this. Um, it's six pounds, which is like 7.5 uh, US dollars. And... It's quite short. It's a short read. You should finish it in a couple of hours or something. And inshallah, we'll have answers to a lot of your questions that have to do with the topic of the necessity of hadith. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Okay, so uh, um, he, I let him uh, advertise his book. This is why I think he's a very genuine person. It's a, he's a book. He's just trying to get back the cost. He just wants the money. Uh, no, sorry, he doesn't want the money. He just wants the money he put in so he, so he can keep living, okay? He is truly in his heart, sincerely, trying to serve his God and guide people to the truth. He's a brother that I saw that he really does care. And I told him from the first day, this is a person I very respect. But the answer about his book, well, you can read his book and see what he says and maybe consider what he's saying. But, but I do have a book that like kind of negates him. And, and this book is called the Quran. Okay, so the Quran here, it's a fairly a short book. Uh, you can read it between seven and ten hours, but their scholars can read it four times a day, some of them. Some of them made it six or eight times a day reading this book, which takes about roughly about ten hours. But uh, this book negates his book. His book is saying that this book is complete. This book has all the religious guidance that you need. This book is what made Prophet Muhammad very great. This is the book that Prophet Muhammad extracted all his judgments for his time and his people. And God wants you to use this book and follow the example of your prophet and use this book and extract the judgments for your people, for your time and your society. Now, God also goes as far as saying that this is the book we recite to you in truth. These are the verses of God we recite to you in truth. So in what hadith do they believe in after God in his verses? This book came and united the Middle East. Their books and their interpretations and their hundreds of books divided it. And it keeps getting divided. Farida, I'm not... I don't think you will ever approach our place or maybe our understanding. But please be honest. Is the book of Hadith, Bukhari and Muslim, can you say it's 100% Sahih? Because I can tell you this book is 100% Sahih. Is the Bukhari and the Muslim equal to this? No. So please stop saying that it's 100% uh, Sahih. Because it keeps destroying your country. And this is why God is not supporting us. Because of the lies. Just like the Christians, just like the Jews. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah six pounds which is like 7.5 uh, us dollars and it's quite short it's a short read you should finish it in a couple of hours or something and inshallah we'll have answers to a lot of your questions that have to do with the topic of the necessity of hadith i'll catch you guys in the next one assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh